think this is seven, seven to ten years ago, there wasn't this sort of like focus on light roasted, like specialty coffee. When we were first open, people used to come in here and curse us out. I mean, literally would curse us out because how dare we charge $2 for a cup of coffee when McDonald's right there is charging a dollar? How don't we give free refills? You know, you don't have half and half, you don't have caramel syrups. Like, and people were legitimately mad. And so when other coffee shops started opening, it was like, oh, okay, this, is, this can be a new thing. You know, it, you don't have to drink that coffee, but if you want to, it's there. You know, it's not just this yeah. gi giant white elephant in the room. It's kind of a miracle when you have a really good cup of coffee. Basically, there's a thousand ways to have a not good cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of things need to go right in this really long chain for things to actually taste good. I would say that the majority of the flavor structure within the coffee is, is in the, the growing part, you know, in the agricultural side. So you start with just the plant itself. You have varietals. You have things that taste really good, things that taste different, and then based on where they're planted and how those cherries are processed, it will totally change the flavor. And then, then you add in, you know, altitude and drought and what happened the year, that year in the agricultural part, and then the processing, how the seed is taken out of the coffee cherry itself, um, these all have a huge impact on what the coffee is doing during the roast profile. You know, roasted coffee, quote unquote, is, is after coffee is cracked. And during the roast profile, coffee cracks, kind of like popcorn pops. It's a very similar sound, it pop, 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 pop. And that's when coffee is technically roasted. And then after that, you know, the depth of that roast after that is where you get, you know, city, city plus, full city, French roast, Vienna, whatever the terms are. But as you're in the middle of a roast profile, um, a matter of minutes, a matter of a couple degrees temperature can make a huge impact on the flavor of the coffee. Now when you roast it, there's a ton of things you can do to accentuate body, to accentuate sweetness, to accentuate acidity. Like, you can take it very light, very dark. The more you accentuate uh, the lightness, the more you're accentuating a lot of the inherent characteristics of the bean. So you kind of have to balance that with sort of the dark roast part. Things can be so dark, you're just tasting the roasting process. You're not tasting anything inside yeah. the bean. We kind of finesse a lot of the different nuances of the coffee out, you know, whether it be acidity, sweetness, uh, body, um, and then the balance of all of those things. So it's kind of similar to cooking. You know, a lot of vegetables and a lot of meats and stuff have their own inherent flavors, but as a cook or a chef, you bring those flavors out to the, to the surface. You don't necessarily change the flavors, you just allow them to be more nuanced and more out. Every different type of brewing method will, will have an impact on the coffee, for sure. All we're doing is pulling what's water soluble out of these beans into a water solution. Um, but, I mean, I, there's just a gazillion ways to do that. So a French press kind of lends itself to pulling out a little bit more of the body and the grit, and kind of the funk in coffee, because it's, coffee's basically sitting in its oils and just kind of stewing, if you will. It's almost like a big marinade. Well, like a pour over with what we do, because we have a, usually a paper filter that separates the grounds from the end result, is a cleaner, crisper, kind of sweeter, more like articulated cup of coffee. Um, and of course, espresso is espresso. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a short, kind of intense shot of coffee as opposed to something that's a little bit bigger volume. I do pour overs at home. I love like the human hands-on approach to it. Um, I find a very like zen-like making a cup of coffee. Having your hands on something and, and, and accomplishing something to me is, is really enjoyable. The process itself is centering. It helps me wake up. Um, and then obviously it's just a very connective moment to grind your beans, to you know, do the water, and then just to like, and then to have that kind of first couple sips of just like, uh, yeah, have a really nice sort of wake up ritual for the day. Where I think coffee shops, I mean, I think there's just a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, a place to study, a place to get away, a place for just rest, to just be quiet, have a ritual. Some people, I think a lot of people just like that, like social interaction. Um, even if it's just to go sit down and open up the laptop, I think there's, there's just something nice being out of your house and being around other people, um, hearing music, 
hearing other people talk. I mean, coffee shops historically, I mean, it was the place of ideas. It was the place where a lot of social revolution unrest <laughs> happened. It was like, okay, I don't have money for the tavern, but I can go to the coffee shop. We're really lucky, you know, because everyone here is really close. You know, the coffee world is, is really close. Um, in fact, where I roast coffee is with the Rose Park facility and recreational roast, roast there. And so we're, we're, we're friends and, you know, we go out and get beers together or we chat. Um, we kind of converse of which wholesale they're going after and what we're going after so we don't step on anyone's toes. And it sounds like a, fair, like a fantasy land, but it's actually legit. Like, I'm really proud to be part of the Long Beach coffee scene because judging both from what I hear in other parts of the country, we kind of have it made.